Natasha Martinengo. Storming down the pit lane. Weekdays from 12 to 2 p.m. Central African time. It is Balls Visual Radio Gears with Sasha Martiningo Thursday afternoon. I want to record this for prosperity. The 7th of June 2012 and been waiting to speak to this guy for quite a while. Um, born in South Africa, races in uh, well all over Europe at the moment. Haven't seen him since he was about three years old or something like that. Uh, he won't remember that, but that's okay. But it is such a pleasure to have the young, very, very talented Callan O'Keefe on the line via Skype all the way from the UK. Callan, great to have you on Gears. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you very, very much for having me. It's a real honor to be on Gears. Oh, that is just and that accent, I tell you. How long have you been in the UK now? Uh, it's been a bit mixed up because we've moved here twice, but it's coming up to the end of the fourth year now, so... It's been quite a while. Lost the South African accent already, sadly. But but the amazing thing is you've chosen still to to ride and drive uh, as a South African, which is, uh, I mean, it's great for us here in South Africa. What made you choose that? Oh, I'm South African through and through. Whether I live in England, whether I live in Australia, no matter what, I'm still South African. And that I'm is, proud of it. What a really proud, good. what a proud, proud guy. Callan, um, we'll talk, you know, I hope you've got a bit of time there and I'm sure you're, uh, you know, you're not going out any practice today or uh, jetting off to go and do some races this weekend. No, just a case of revision. I've got exams next week, back to the normal world and obviously training every day to keep fit and strong, but I've got a lot of time to talk to you guys, so there's no problem. Well, well let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, because you've got to, you, you, you're you racing basically on a, on a full-time basis, and we'll get to, into where you are at the moment, but you also still have to do school. Oh, yeah, of course. It's, uh, it's a mix between life of the real world, which is school and trying to pass like every other kid and then trying to win on the racing track. So it makes it a bit more difficult, but... As I say, if it was easy, everybody would do it. So it's a bit more fun. Let Let's start. I mean, uh, how did you get into into racing? What What triggered it off from you when you were a young kid? I mean, when you moved over to the UK for the first time, or were you still in South Africa? What made you decide you wanted to get into racing? It, it all the love of it started when I was quite young. When I was four, my dad took me to Kyle Army with my other brother to see the Williams Formula One cars test. And they came around the mine shaft corner and I jumped my height. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that, that's when I knew that that's what I wanted to do. But obviously I had to put the dream on hold for a little bit for about eight years. And I just kept begging my parents to buy me a go-kart. And when I was 12, they eventually gave in. And you start off at the local club race and work your way up slowly and now I'm, I'm here driving for Red Bull it's just like a dream come true I mean it's quite incredible I mean you've only been racing for a for a few years now it's not as though you started in karts at four or five years old I mean you started at 12 years old and now you're a Red Bull racing development driver I mean that's an extraordinary jump from go-karts to Red Bull oh it's it's crazy when you think about it most of the other kids they start when they're eight years old to, to start a bit later and to do more than what they've done in a short period of time is just it's it's amazing and obviously all the all the thanks goes out to all the teams that I've been with and also my family for supporting me and all the people that have helped me along the way because it wouldn't be possible without them well i mean listen you've got you you've got a great family in in your mom and dad and also your uh, your uh, brothers but um as we know motorsport is not a cheap undertaking so it's all cool you know dad says okay here's your go-kart he must probably thought well you know let's just keep him happy for a while it'll wane and he'll go back to playing cricket or rugby at school now all of a sudden you got to sit there and say dad you got to uh, start throwing some pounds here yeah i'm very lucky in the way obviously i've got the support from red bull but i've also got support from tag Heuer. i've also got support from eye cover and correlation risk management and they're all helping me progress along the way and have done in previous years. So, as I said, and as you said as well, it's all good and well for the, the little bit of time in go-karting. But motorsport is a very, very expensive sport. So, I'd just like to say thanks for them because without them, it wouldn't be possible. It's incredible. So, when you first got into a go-kart uh, your first time and you decided, okay, Dad, listen, let's go down to the local track. Uh, you're in Guildford, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. It's the local track is about an hour and a half from where I live in Kent. Okay, so you went to Kent. You decided there, there you are in your little go kart. Did you have any uh, idea of setups, or did you just want to start the thing, go around the track? 
I, I didn't know what I was doing. You just, you get in, you sort of, it's just an alien world. It all feels so fast and it all comes at you so quickly. And obviously a little go-kart is so responsive that every little steering input you make makes a difference. And the first time I did it was a bit of a shock, but it was just an amazing feeling. And you know from then on that that's all you want to do and it becomes like your drug. And you, you don't ever want to give it up and there's not even any any sort of thought of that ever happening, which is quite nice. So, I, I mean, it's just extraordinary how that happened. So you go out there, you're, on a, you're going around doing a few laps, your dad's with you. Was your mom with you at the, on, in your first go-kart ride? It was just me and my dad. We, okay. we went to the local track and then I did about five laps. And I just came in and I just said to my dad, if you love me, you'll buy me the go-kart. <laughs> so, yeah. That is that is great news. And then when you went home and said, "Listen, mom, I really, really like this go karting stuff. I'm I'm now going to go and you know pursue it a little bit further." What did I mean? What was her reaction? I mean, a mother's always going to sit there and say, "You know, element of danger. I don't want you to do it." Or did she sit there and say, "Okay, let's give it a bash." I think she's always been really supportive of me, as my family have, and I'm quite lucky in that way. But I think there's always. There's always the bit of a risk element when it comes to motorsport, and I think that's always consciously in, in the back of everybody's mind. But at the end of the day, as long as you accept that that's part of it, then you can get on with it. And personally, even though she doesn't say it, I think she does actually enjoy it because she's very competitive and she likes seeing me do well. So it's quite nice. Yeah, no, she's. I think she's definitely your biggest supporter. That's uh, that's for sure. I'm very lucky to have the parents I do so. Yeah, which is which is great. You know, it always does help. Okay, so karting, um, you decided that's it. We're going to go karting. Then how did you progress now into becoming competitive and going into races um, and, and finding that extra kind of – your first ever sponsor. Who was your first ever sponsor that came on board? Oh, the first sponsor was uh, probably my dad was the first official sponsor. <laughs> but then as, as it goes on slowly, you begin to pick up. And as I said, I got correlation, risk management, eye cover, tag wear. And then the last notable one was Red Bull. Come on, but show us your watch. You've got to have a... <laughs> there it is. Oh, it's there the, we go. 100, a very, very nice one. Listen, I'm, uh, sure, I'm sure the guys, uh, the Red Bull drivers, Sebastian and Mark, must be a little bit jealous that you've got a tag Hoya and they're not, they're not wearing... I know what they're wearing, but they're not wearing tags. The, the last one, the last junior ambassador, which is the position I have a tag, was actually Sebastian Vettel, so... It's it's quite a nice role to follow on, and hopefully I can do the same thing that he's done. You never know. Oh, well, I, we're confident uh, that you will. So we go back to to karting. You all of a sudden become uh, very competitive. People start noticing you, um, and then you, you you know now you want to go. You want to progress from karts. How did you go about that? Well, the the normal thing in karting is you start off at the local club race, mm -hmm. build your way up slowly over a few years, then you go to national level, then international level. With me, it was a bit more rushed. I went one, one year of club-level racing and then straight into international racing. And uh, it, you have to be consistently at the top. And I won last year. I won the first nine out of ten international finals. Jeez. And then that's, that's when you get the call from, from Dr. Marco at Red Bull saying, we want to meet with you at Silverstone. And then from there, you begin to talk. And once you get noticed, a few other teams begin to pick around as well. And then... Yeah, once once you've made your choice, that's it. You're signed, and you know that you're hopefully on the road to Formula One. I mean, you know, you talk about Doctor Doctor Marco. For those who don't know, Helmut Marco, of course, uh, basically spearheads the whole of uh, the Red Bull Racing team under Dietrich Matzeschitz and, and Christian Horner. I mean, that must have been quite, kind of surreal to get a phone call and saying, "Hello, Kellen, this is Doctor Marco." <laughs> I'll be in Silverstone. We'd like to see you. That's that's a very good impersonation, but um, <laughs> you know, it was, uh, it was uh, a little bit surreal. Yeah, we we didn't actually think it was anything serious, and then we got there, and you know, you sit down, and he begins to start making an offer, and you, your jaw just drops, and you you can't believe you've gone from club level racer, nobody knows who you are, to being close to being signed up by the best team in Formula One's driver development program in the space of two years. It's just a surreal experience. And I'll never forget that day when I went there. Still got it firmly imprinted in my mind. Oh, man, that is just something incredibly special. Callan, stay with us. We're going to take a quick song here on uh, Gears. 
Our guest or my guest here this afternoon is the brilliantly talented Callan O'Keefe, who, of course, at uh, this stage is competing in 2012 in the Formula uh, BMW Talent Cup. We'll find out uh, a little bit more. We've just found out that he got the phone call, met up with Helmut Marco. From there, we're going to find out how it is all progressed to where he is today and where he's going in the future. Stay with me here on Gears. Hear the back. Tango special guest live via Skype. All the way from uh, Guildford in the UK is, in my opinion, South Africa's uh, brightest talent when it comes to single-seater racing. A man who, uh, a young man, who already is a Red Bull development driver. His name, Callan O'Keefe. Callan, you told us about meeting with uh, Dr. Marco. What process did you have to go from there um, you know, to, to become the Red Bull, one of the Red Bull development drivers. I mean, it's not as though, oh, we saw you, Kart, that was cool, come along. Or was it? Yeah, it's not quite as simple as that. We got, obviously, to talk to Dr. Marco. And then from there, we had uh, to go through a selection process at Estoril. And uh, that was straight out of karting. We said, you know, what happens next? And we had to go to Estoril in Portugal at the end of, end of last year to do a test in the Formula Renault 2.0, which is mm-hmm. a, an incredibly fast car, and obviously... Well, it must have been a hell, of a hell of a step up from what you, were, what you were driving. Unbelievable. It's just a completely different world. And, uh, yeah, went to the test, and I wasn't actually fit enough. I got told I was, but I wasn't. And uh, after about five laps, I couldn't hang on anymore. My neck started going and just became a helpless passenger. But obviously, I did something right in those those five laps each morning. And uh, yeah, <laughs> after that, I got told that I was part of the program and just over, over the moon, so happy. And now I'm going on the way. I mean, uh, that must be incredible. I mean, and your, and your parents, did they, did they expect this kind of um, passion and love and progression? I mean, because it's been a very, very quick progression. When, when Helmut Marco sits and says, okay, Callum, we need you down in Portugal. Uh, here's your air ticket come along uh, and you come back and you say hey mom check my new red bull shirt <laughs> it's like uh it's 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 a bit crazy because although they said that you know they they firmly believe that i could have been formula one world champion i think when when you start out there's always a bit of doubt and understandably of course because you are spending a lot of money to do it but i think that the year before that when i started winning everything that was the realization that hang on I could actually do this, and that's when I came to the realization of it as well. Before then, it was just sort of a dream. But then I think once once you come to that realization, and then it's affirmed as well by Dr. Marco calling you up, then then I think you know it goes from being the well maybe it's possible to the you know it's got a really good chance of doing it. So you never know for the future, but hopefully I can keep going in that path. Yeah, well, we you definitely have all of the support here from from South Africa, that's for sure. So you um, so you get the Red Bull Development Driver um, gig, in a way. Do they do they then steer where they want you to go and race? For example, now you're in the uh, BMW Talent Cup. Is, yeah. is that is that a Red Bull decision for you? Yeah, it's it's all sort of mapped out for you on the proviso, of course, that you keep winning. That's that's the pretty obvious one. And uh, yeah, it'll go. The, the most likely progression is you go from Formula BMW, which I'm in at the moment. You go to next year, it'll be something like Formula Renault 2.0. Then it depends. There's two sort of routes you could take. You could go Renault 3.5, which is basically a level down from Formula One, or you could go into Formula 3, which is again quite similar. And then from there, it, it splits up as to whether you go GP2 or straight into Formula One. I think it, it all depends. But at the moment, I'm still in the early stages. I'm just trying to make sure that you do everything right, you know, day by day. And uh, yeah, then the results come and you keep moving up. To, um, which is incredible. We'll talk about some of the races you've uh, already had because you've had two different meets uh, already this season in BMW Talent Cup. But tell us a, a normal day in the life of Callan O'Keefe. Let's say no school. All right. Oh. So, so in terms of, as you say, when you went to to do the first uh, test in Estoril, you realised you weren't fit enough. How has that changed now? Um, your diet, your fitness regime, uh, and what you are pushing yourself to get to. Uh, the the diet, but I've always been quite good with the diet. Like I haven't had a fizzy drink in three years. I just I'm very firm on 
feeding your body with the right sort of fuels to keep you going because obviously I, I live quite a, a frantic day in life and you need to keep yourself going but after that realizing that you weren't fit enough you have a, a winter short period of time to get everything right and so for the last four to five months we've just been really pushing hard with my trainer Roger Cleary and we've gotten the fitness level up now to a level where sort of just below a GP2 driver if not on par with some of them and that's just been four and a half hours a day over the winter just absolutely destroying yourself to make sure that when you get into the car there's there's no element of am I fit enough you can just focus purely on the driving. Oh, that is, uh, I mean, yeah, it's a tremendous amount of dedication, a tremendous amount of sacrifice as well. Um, Formula One uh, drivers now, let's say, especially in in the last 20 years or so, have become really, really top professional athletes. Uh, you know, you have one or two that uh, have, have a little bit too much fun. But, um, I mean, you are very focused on this role that, that is ahead of you. Yeah, it's a... Uh I, put, I was telling my parents the other night, every thought process that goes through my mind is, will I do this? And if I do it, will it help me become Formula One World Champion? At the end of the day, that's, that's all I really want to do. And so I'm, I'm very firmly focused on what I need to do and how I need to do it. And so hopefully that's going to keep me going and keep me going in the right direction. <laughs> so your dad will save on, on all of the money you'll save, which you would have needed to go out to the pub. He's not going to just have to put back exactly. into your motor racing. Exactly. <laughs> oh, that's great news. Um, I was reading in, in some of one of your interviews somewhere along the line, uh, one of your big heroes from, from motorsport has been um, Ayrton Senna. Course. Okay, but you would have also been too young to really have known Senna. Yeah. Is it just from years of following Formula One and, and its history that you actually just cottoned on to saying, wow, what a talent? Yeah, I sadly missed the Senna era. He died two years before I was born. But then obviously there's, there's film footages and stuff like that. And obviously being a driver, you understand how, how amazing the feeling is to get to the limit of what's actually physically possible in a racing car. And the ability that Senna had to do that constantly and just switch it on is what I really admire. And when he talks about the deep levels of concentration when he got to, like at Monaco, where he was just driving through a tunnel. And as a driver, you only really dream of getting to that sort of level of concentration and being in tune with the car. And so obviously I think he's a great role model to look up to and try and get to that sort of point. Obviously just his ability was unbelievable, especially in the rain. Yeah, I mean, an, an extraordinary uh, racing driver. And speaking of of, uh, of Formula One, um, you, I think there were some pictures the other day. Uh, you went and, and met uh, Mark Webber and Sebastian Vettel. Have you had any opportunity to sit and chat with them at all? I've met. I met Sebastian at the Autosport Awards. Okay. And uh, yeah, I had, a, I had a little talk with him, and you know, you say I'm part of the junior team, and obviously he he went through it not so long ago, so he understands. But uh, hopefully he's looking over his shoulder every once in a while to see where I'm going, catching up on him, hopefully. <laughs> I'm sure he is, that's for sure. Especially with the results that you, uh, you bring in as well. Never mind Mark Webber losing his seat. It could be Sebastian Vettel losing his <laughs> seat. I want to know, from a technical point of view, Callan, are you, are you um, one of those drivers who uh, technically um, really, really helps your engineers? Um, because, you know, there are drivers who, who are brilliant in that, that sphere of life, um, and there are others who just sit there and say, you know what, give me the car and I will drive around it. And in my opinion, I think there obviously is an element that you have to be able to, to focus solely on the driving. But one of the ways to be able to push the car to the limit is to understand how the car is built, how it responds to certain things. And so from that respect, I try to focus as much time as I can to the technical side of things and gaining an understanding of certain things with the car because then when it comes down to that fight with somebody the last few laps you've pushed the car to the absolute limit you know that little bit more and how to get that little bit more out of the machine and hopefully that'll end up and you coming out on top in the race yeah which is you know of course uh, uh, e extremely vital um let's move into what you're doing at, at present, it's the Formula BMW Talent Cup. You, is it two, two different uh, events you've had, Sweden and uh, Valencia? Yeah, we did one race in Sweden, which was quite good. I've pulled it by nine thousandths of a second. Okay. I don't, don't even know how you can measure that. And then in the race, I went on to win by three and a half seconds, I think it was, before the safety car and, came out. 
and the competition in that i mean have, you've got other red bull development drivers and drivers from all over the world how is it massively competitive it is it's, it's also quite a good series in the way that all of us it's our first year in open we are racing okay all the cars are the same all the setups are the same you switch around engineers and driver coaches everybody gets everybody's data so it is it's it's very much down to the best driver wins the race there's no technical side well my engine's not as good as this one so it it makes it a bit more interesting from that respect listen it is it, it is always easier when you are in the front um, and and you seem to be incredibly quick, never mind in the race, but also in your qualifying performances. Valencia, three races, and you won two out of the three years, uh, if I'm correct. Yeah, it was. I took three three out of three poles. The last one was by one and a half seconds, which was wow. really good. But then That's, obviously, that is Senna esque. That that was. I was very pleased when I saw that. That was that made my day. It was it was a lap that was very much on the limit. If I'd gone a little bit more, I probably would have ended up in the gravel. But um, in, in the races, it was quite difficult because you have quite a long straight at Valencia. Mm -hmm. Obviously, slipstreaming plays quite a big part. And so it's very important to get away on the first few laps. And uh, sadly, in, in the second race, I couldn't quite do that and got overtaken in the slipstream. It's a bit like DRS now in Formula One. Yeah, You go the inside to block, but there's nothing you can do. They just come hurdling down the outside. But then you learn from that. And then for the next race, I made sure that I broke the broke the slipstream before anybody could get past so yeah okay and how many of these um, uh, um races do you have this year uh all in all i think it's about 13 or 14 races okay with all of it hinging on the the grand final at the end of the year when we support the dtm at oschleben oh that'll be awesome um and in terms of circuits are there quite a few circuits that you're going to be racing on this year that you've never seen before i haven't seen any, any of, the of them we've been to this year so it should be, it's a bit more interesting when you turn up and you don't really know where you're going. But then again, it helps because in, in future series, it's, uh, it's not going to be possible to do very much testing. Yeah. So it helps you develop and get fast on a circuit really quickly. All right, Callan, uh, listen, a little bit about your personal life because we've got Diana who's just arrived in the studio and she thinks you're mighty cute. So, so the thing is, you're 15 years old. You've got this tremendous focus on being, uh, you know, a Formula One driver, Formula One champion. How are you dealing with the, the sort of the fame side, the adulation side? Uh, do you have a girlfriend? Where's your priority? Uh, does your mom give you a clip around the ear? How does it work? <laughs> Yeah, I think my parents are still keeping my feet firmly planted on the floor. <laughs> so, uh, as soon as I get out of line, I get a little hit in the head. But yeah, at, at the moment, like I say, it's it's all a bit difficult. Don't have a girlfriend. I'm very much focused on the racing. You can't. It's not really a part-time thing. You have to sure. be focused on the racing or your schoolwork at any given point. You can't. You can't have split split things. So. Yeah, it, it it means life is a, is a little bit less sort of interesting for the normal person. But then again, I'm living the dream. So in that respect, it makes it a bit better. Okay, so uh, so what did you get for your birthday? Your birthday was yesterday, wasn't it? No, no, my birthday's on Saturday. Oh, so coming up on Saturday? I not out yet, yeah. Okay, so birthday's coming up on, on Saturday, which is yeah. uh, terrific. And you're now going to be 16. I can legally buy a lottery ticket. <laughs> you see, that's a, it's a good way of looking at things. One thing I want to ask you is you're 16 years old. You're still growing. Yeah. Um, we all know the taller you, you, you get in the world of Formula One, the more difficult it is. Although over the last few years, the likes of Mark Webber, who's at sort of 6'1", Jensen Button round about the same height. Are you concerned? Because you come from a relatively tall family. Uh, I'm not concerned about that. There's there's ways of predicting how tall you're going to get. I mean, my mother is quite short as well. Which, oh, which she's... hopefully I'll follow her genes. <laughs> but um, yeah, <laughs> we, there's there's certain ways that you can predict these sort of things, various body scans and stuff like that. And at the moment, my body composition is is looking pretty perfect to be a Formula One driver. So there's no worries there. And at the end of the day, if if you are a bit taller, it just means you have to work a bit harder. So. I've been working hard my whole life. There's there's no reason why a couple of extra inches should stop me from being a Formula One driver. Yeah, no, that's that's for sure. I'm glad to hear that as well. If, for example, Callan, uh, end of this year, um, Dr. Helmut Marko calls you again and says, step up, we want you Red Bull 
uh, test driver for the year, uh, which means you go to all of the tracks. Unfortunately, as we know, in testing, there's not much uh, testing that you would actually do, but they give you yeah. a test driver role. How would that affect you in terms of your schooling, finishing off um, those that, that part of your life? I think realistically that wouldn't happen within the next sort of two to three years because obviously they don't want to stick you in a Formula One car when you're not strong enough or you haven't finished your education. They're very, very firm on that. Okay, that's good to hear. If, if that was to happen, you know, within the next two to three years, I think that's, that's when you realize that your life gets completely taken over by Formula One. Obviously, you'd still try to continue schooling, maybe do some, some part-time university courses when you get the time, but it is incredibly difficult. It is, it is a whole year-round thing. Every single day is dedicated to Formula One. So I think the, the dedication side would stay the same, but you'd just be a lot more busy and traveling and more training. So we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it, hopefully one day. Yeah, that, and, and we will get there. I'm sure we will. Callan, listen, it's uh, it's such a pleasure to speak to you. Uh, you really have a tremendous amount of fans here in South Africa, and hopefully we'll get a lot more from uh, from chatting to you here on Gears. We're following you very, very closely, and anytime you want to chat to us, just uh, pop us a mail, and we'll definitely have you online. We'll be following all of your races as well, and uh, we wish you all of the, the tremendous success that uh, you're continuing to do at the moment in the BMW uh, Talent Cup. We know you're going to win that one, and uh, we know that you're going to be South Africa's next Formula One driver and hopefully champion. Thank you very, very much for having me and looking forward to speaking to you guys soon. All the best. There we go. Callan O'Keefe. Oh, yeah, and by the way, love to your whole family. Uh, thanks, same to you. Okay, there we go. Callan O'Keefe live from Guildford. Uh, we'll have the part of the vodcast up a little bit later on as well. Go and check him out. He's on Twitter as well, CJ O'Keefe Racing. You can follow him. I'll tweet that all up a little bit later as well. Also, we'll have uh, stuff on Facebook. And uh, this is definitely South Africa's next superstar. What a pleasure to have him right here on Gears. on bulls.co.za with Sasha Martinengo. He's kept himself out of trouble. Weekdays from 12 to 2 p.m. Central African time.